If you guys have ever played any sports games, such as Madden, NBA 2K, or FIFA, you would know that they have these historical teams, teams from the past that were legendary and known for being amazing. Which brings an interesting topic to League of Legends. What if you came up with a list of great champions from the past? Not talking about professional players, but actually champions. You see, tier lists are incredibly popular at the moment. And even over on Pro Guides, by the way, if you don't use Pro Guides, and you're not a subscriber to the Pro Guides YouTube channel, you should absolutely do it because this is the best tier list available for you. We use fresh statistics all the time to make sure you're climbing with the best champions in solo queue. And if you use the Pro Guides tier list and subscribe to the YouTube channel today, you're doing yourself a favor because we post amazing content on there. I'm a part of the Pro Guides team, so do that in the description down below. So how interesting would it be to take a look at some of the best champions for a tier list? Not just talking about this patch, because of course, we talk about that all the time over at Pro Guides. How about if we looked at an all-time tier list for League of Legends, some of the best champions ever, and we place them and talk about them. So let's do it. Let's run down by each role the top champions of all time for an all-time League of Legends tier list. Just so you guys know for the formatting, the way we'll be doing it today is that the S tier will be the best champions of all time and some of the most broken, overpowered ideas to ever exist in that role. And then the A tier will be mostly honorable mentions or things that were super, super strong for sure and needed to be nerfed repeatedly, but were not the single best thing to ever exist in the role. Anyway, let's get started. With this all-time tier list, we will start off pretty darn strong, with arguably and probably the most overpowered and broken champion of all time. During beta, Jax was nearly impossible to kill due to his extremely high dodge chance. With a couple of Phantom Dancers, his Counter-Strike, and Ninja Tabby, Jax could actually stand in the fountain and kill people. Dodge used to work on turret shots. Many players have said before that Beta Twisted Fate was the strongest champ of all time, however reading through many YouTube comments and forum posts from players who have claimed to play in the beta, this guy was apparently the strongest champion who ever lived in their mind. Regardless, he's S tier worthy without question. For preseason 3, it brought us the Black Cleaver meta, which would end up being the single most broken, overpowered, unbalanced, and unfair item to ever exist in the game. Riven and other champions such as Talon and Pantheon make this list. Riven could have also made this list during the season 4 meta of starting Elixir of Fortitude. Starting this item was absolutely insane, and with Ignite being a stronger summoner spell at the time, Riven was known for being the best top laner and most broken during this era. During the early game, you were literally un one v one Back in Season 1 and Season 2, League of Legends had a problem with sustain, and Yorick was a huge beneficiary of this sustain meta, something that was genuinely a massive issue. At one point, this champion was actually, truly impossible to lane against. There are champions now us in Season 9 joke about and cry about like Teemo, Renekton, and Heimerdinger being impossible to lane against, but those are honestly child's play compared to what this champion was. He had so much damage, sustain, AoE, and wave clear that you were literally pushed in constantly and when your jungler came, by the way this isn't season 9 where your hecarim has bone plating, conqueror, red smite, ignite, the jungler was basically a second support back in the day, you both got 1v2 no problem. No issue whatsoever for your to be legendary at 5 minutes. Topping off our S tier for top lane, let's go all the way back to one of the first OP builds for Kennen, which was using an item called Zanya's Ring. This was an item that made him especially good and really, really OP because it was simply off the charts for Kennen. He has always wanted to prioritize building a Zanya's Hourglass in today's game, and the fact that this item was Zanya's and Deathcap in one... Whew, Zanya's plus Void Staff in Zork Shoes back then, your entire team was going to get 1v5 Smeb style. Expect gets caught down. He's got it. PA, remember, but he needs Megan. Oh, oh no! Delete it! Remember, I've seen one at G2 or Aced! For our all time A tier, let's run through quickly some of the best top lane champions of all time. Vladimir in every season has been consistently a strong and oppressive pick, and really tough to balance. It's hardly ever a time where Vladimir isn't strong in the meta, and a good pick for both top and mid lane. At one point, Bruiser AD Fizz was a thing multiple times, but during the Iceborne Gauntlet tank meta, Tank Fizz was pretty darn oppressive. Tyler1 really hated playing against it. What the f 
boosted broken fucking 80 fucking what the fuck? This tank fucking meta is so fucking stupid. Fiora was reworked in Season 5, with the introduction of Fervor of Battle in Season 6, and finally in Season 7 with a very favorable split push meta, Fiora was a top tier top lane option, and was basically everything a Jax and Trindamir wanted to be, and she was even more OP with stronger abilities. She really hasn't recovered ever since those days after her nerfs, when she was truly the grand duelist of top lane. After introducing Kleptomancy and Grasp of the Undying as keystones in the game during Rune's Reforge, it quite frankly broke Gangplank. He became significantly stronger than intended due to his interaction with these runes, and he was also an abuser of Trinity Force and Steric's Gage. Pantheon during the Black Cleaver Season 3 meta was another massive abuser of the item, similar to Talon and Riven on this list. Patch 5.11 was a fantastic patch for Jace. His R was given automatic transformations at level 6, 11, and 16, while adding 6 rank ups to the rest of his abilities. Before this patch, he was not very stable nor great in the meta. He was pretty much a dead champion that no one played. Ever since that patch, he has been a staple top lane and mid lane champion. Finally, Poppy was the most broken tank during the Iceborne Gauntlet and Sunfire Cape meta. While there were other champions that were good such as Nautilus, Gragas, and even Echo, Bruiser, Tank, Top Lane, Poppy had the other option of being extremely OP on top of the items being really darn good. She was clearly the biggest benefactor. Alright, let's move on to the jungle. For S tier jungle, let's start with Skarner. The Juggernaut rework is one of the most laughable and horrible things Riot has ever done, and they completely broke the crap out of four champions. And while Mordekaiser bot lane would become the most hotly contested pick at Worlds, along with Darius in the top lane, Skarner's reign of terror in solo queue was unmatched. League of Legends has been out for nearly a decade, and this champion still holds the highest win rate of all time. According to certain sites, he was around a 64 or 65% win rate, but it's very possible and speculated that for about a week, he had nearly a 70% win rate. It's likely that there will never be a win rate this high ever again. Kha'Zix was the strongest assassin in the game in seasons 3 and 4, and he could have been played even mid and top lane, as well of course the jungle. There were some nerfs given to him that were meant to gut him, but due to some compensation that he received on his ultimate giving damage reduction, he became even more overpowered and was an off tank bruiser. He dominated the jungle meta. To say that Sejuani during the Cinderhulk meta was good is like saying that people like to eat ice cream. It's really a no-brainer. This item single-handedly took her into Assassin, Tank Bruiser, Mage, invading DPS Sejuani, who also had the potential to hit 5 people with her ultimate. She was unkillable and carried every single game. Xin Zhao's release goes without question, because most people these days know that he was the most overpowered release of a champion of all time. He was so beyond overtuned it wasn't even funny. He had higher ranges, more damage, more healing, more crowd control, lower cooldowns, he literally could run into 4 people and probably kill every single one single handedly just by auto attacking them down. Finally, it wouldn't be a jungle all time tier list if we didn't talk about Lee Sin. While he's not that problematic right now, Lee Sin has to be reflected upon. For literally three years, Lee Sin was the most contested and popular champion in the game, as well as of course dominant in competitive play. He shaped the jungle meta. He wasn't just strong in the meta, he defined it embraced it, and controlled it. Your champion that you picked in the jungle role was put to the test versus Lee Sin every single game, and the question became for every new jungler that people thought was good, yeah, you might think it's good, but can it survive a Lee Sin invade? Can it outperform Lee Sin? Is it a better ganker than Lee Sin? He is probably the all-time best champion in League's history due to how long he was strong for, and he's been nerfed at least a dozen times and is still playable today. Alright, let's talk about A tier. Rengar during Season 4 was a nightmare, and Samsung White's Season 4 World Championship jungler named Dandy chose Rengar for a reason. During the Season 4 World Championships, he was absolutely impossible to jungle against and was the strongest assassin. There was also a meta where Rengar could build AP and become not just a single target assassin, but an AoE assassin with his W. Yeah. There was a time where Ramus was absolutely disgusting, and he held nearly a 60% win rate in solo queue and was even stronger in competitive play. The meta was very favorable for him, with tons of AD champions and AD assassins such as Talon, Zed, Rengar, Caitlyn, Graves, Riven, Lee Sin, you name it, Ramus countered it. 
In Pre-Season 5, Devourer was added to the jungle item list, and Warwick quickly shot up to being the strongest champion in the game. Remember that Warwick is largely considered the easiest champion to play back then, and specifically to jungle with. You could even jungle him without proper runes. You took Red Smite and Devourer and you pressed R, which was point and click, and you killed someone. It was really simple. In that same line of thought, Devourer was reworked a little bit and changed around later that season, and Shyvana became the best jungler in the game with the new Sated Devourer. You could stack this baby up just like Feral Flare, and at 30 stacks, you ran Hogwild all over the game. There was a point in time, back in Season 1, that Evelyn had these two things in her kit that made her pretty insane. She had a point and click stun, and she had 60 seconds of stealth. I guess that's really all I have to explain about this champ, like, is there <laughs> anything else that you need to know? Tarzan became popular in Season 6 after hitting Rank 1 on the NA server as a Graves main, and he showed the entire world Graves' true power. This was a direct result of the Marksman update, where Riot wanted to rework Graves into a reloading, shotgun, bruiser, Wild West type of guy. But it turns out that he could knock back jungle camps. And the rest is history. Rek'Sai's release was one of the most infamous for all jungle champs. Truthfully, ever since this champion was put into the game, she's been a top tier jungler. She was her strongest on her release, and had assassin levels of damage with just 3 abilities. Eventually she was utilized for about 3 straight seasons in pro play as a tank jungler, and back then her ultimate was a global teleport, not the execute that it is today. Finally, Kindred's release was Riot's attempt to create a ranged jungler, and to no surprise, it worked out pretty well for Kindred. This champion was incredibly powerful and received nerf after nerf, and at one point she could point and click her ultimate on an ally, rather than always having to cast it on herself like they do right now. Alright, let's move on to the best mid laners of all time. Talon had the highest win rate in the game in the aftermath of the Black Cleaver patch. This one is pretty understandable, and because it allowed an assassin to also get health from the item, it made it a bit easier to play due to your tankiness. Everyone in League of Legends history knows and remembers Season 3 Kassadin, otherwise known as Kassa Win, where he held a solo queue record of 98% ban rate. Kassadin was banned in 98% of all solo queue games. The champion was ridiculous, and on top of being the best anti-mage champion in the game, he wasn't even bad against 80 champions. Like, at all, because he had a silence. So imagine this champion, where his rift walk was further range, he gained more mana back, did more damage, scaled harder, and had a silence. How did you lose as Cassidy? Beta Twisted Fate and Beta Jax are nearly toe to toe as being the most overpowered champs of all time. Let me just run down what Beta TF had. His gold card was an AoE stun. Yes, AoE. His teleport, you know his ultimate, it was his E. It was his E, and it was on a 40 second cooldown. Wait, there's more, there's more. It was global, completely global. This means that if you got even one to two kills and started the game even with the smallest lead, you could literally teleport all over the map before level six even, every 40 seconds, assuming you had no CDR, and point and click stun people. Yeah, TF was only a little bit less broken than Silas is currently, so not bad actually. Beta Rise was weird. Really weird in fact, he had this insane AoE and burst and was this champion that wasn't very strong early game, but as soon as he completed a few mana and AP items, he turned into a god and could honestly 1d5 no problem once he got out of the laning phase. He's not talked about too much as he was changed very quickly, and there's not nearly as much information about him as the beta twisted fate in the beta jacks, he's like this dark horse that was secretly one of the craziest champs in League's history. Lastly, for our S tier, let's talk about Middley. Middley was a solo laner building full AP and is still the strongest poke champion to ever exist, and that will ever exist. Her playstyle was a completely different champion than what she is now. Nowadays, she's this aggressive, invading style jungler whose whole job is to stop the early game and gank every lane. But back then, she just chucked spears. That was her whole job. She literally threw spears all game, and because they took your whole health bar, you just poked. You're like a Xerath whose Q would just take your whole health bar, and it's like you had Dark Harvest built into your kit. It was pretty dumb. Alright, moving on to the A tier mid laners. Ari received a mini rework in Season 5, and the player base was convinced that she would die as a champion, because they actually removed the damage amplification on her charm. They gutted more than a quarter of her damage combo. However, in compensation, she was given the movement speed on her Q, and this is still a great case study in League of Legends on why utility is king in this game. When everyone thought it was a dead champion, instead her win rate rose to 58%. 
Azir is the most dominant mid laner in recent competitive play history. There was a time where he was nearly 100% priority in the pick and ban phase and had over a 55% win rate in pro play. He was untouchable, as his ranges were insane, he was good early game due to being impossible to lane against, but also scaled beyond anything reasonable. He's been nerfed over 10 times since those days. LeBlanc on release is the best assassin to ever be put into League of Legends, but only existed this way for a couple of days before being hotfix. Her base damage was so ridiculous and the famous story is that LeBlanc could start boots and potions and one-shot you at level 2. Release Echo was the modern day LeBlanc, as his release made him become the strongest AP assassin we've seen in nearly 10 years. His damage was far too high and he was known for being impossible to kill and with his alt giving him more health back then, he was basically an AP assassin and kind of like this tank. Ryze's 73rd rework which happened in Season 5 was the strongest champion in the game at the time. Just literally roll the clip. Well, they're the ones who couldn't contest this time around. Meanwhile though, Steve is getting chunked out by Huni, who's finally gotten rolling and he's stunned up after the flash. Huni follows him through and solos him down. Huni, Huni, Huni. What the hell just happened? How does he do that? He hasn't been paying attention to mid lane at all, barring that one gank where Febren flashed out and Huni he knows he can take this right into the minion waves too. So Steve's throwing down the Maelstrom right now, but I don't think he's going anywhere. He zooms on in to find Huni, but his health bar has already melted and you're not going anywhere. Get in the rune prison. Huni's still chunking him down. Finally takes a little bit more damage, but an auto attack will do it again. Four and two on the rise. Zillion at Season 4 Worlds was the most contested pick because it was discovered a few months before the tournament just how OP he was. He was sleeper for a bit, then became the most contested pick. His passive was global. You know the experience thing that gives you increased XP? It was global, for all the champs on your team. Which means that just by picking Zillion, your team would always hit level 2 first across the entire map, and your jungler would be the first jungler to hit level 6. Broken as heck. Before receiving a gunshot wound to his AP ratios, mid lane Gracchus was the strongest mage assassin in the game. With DFG and Deathcap, he blew you up with zero counterplay because he also had crowd control. Lastly, for mid lane, Aurelia's recent rework took a champion that used to be a bruiser top lane and threw her into the mid lane as the strongest lane bully we've seen in a long time. Take Ignite plus Conqueror and all in every chance that you got. Her burst was just far too high and she was crazy tanky with her W damage reduction. Alright, let's move on to the all-time best ADCs. Now, just to be clear, I won't be going over things that were in very, very short bursts and very short times, such as the mage bot lanes, things like Vlad, Swain, Aurelia, Yasuo, not because they weren't good, and not because they weren't utilized by bottom lane players, but mostly just because people see this and view this role as ADCs. So I would like to keep it strictly as ADCs and not mention Heimerdinger, even though Heimerdinger was, by all definitions, a fantastic bottom laner. In March of 2010, Ezreal was buffed and brought up to his most overpowered state of himself in history. Ezreal's abilities were absolutely crazy. His Q had higher range, his W buffed ally attack speed and lowered enemy attack speed. His W had a 1 to 1 heal ratio and his ultimate had a 1 to 1 ratio. Ezreal AP builds were rampant and his E was even a lower cooldown back then. He had so much more utility than he's ever had before and he was absolutely crazy. There was a point in time that Tarek and Urgot were the best bot lane in the game, with Tarek using his point and click CC on his Dazzle to be followed up by Urgot's free poke and harass, or an all in with his old ultimate that made you switch positions with him. This version of Urgot was incredibly overpowered, and nearly unbeatable, until he was finally nerfed when he was nerfed hard. It's one of the biggest nerfs in history. During Seasons 2 and 3, there were the ADC Trio Gods, which were Corky, Graves, and Ezreal. These three ADCs were the entire meta down there, and they defined what good ADCs should be able to do. The reason they were so good is because they were the strongest mid-game by far, with Corky and Ezreal spiking on their Triforce, as well as Graves being really strong on Infinity Edge and Zeal. These champions were good in lane, super OP during mid-game, and still decent enough in late game and scaled pretty well. There just wasn't a reason to pick anything else, because these three did everything you needed back then. They weren't bad enough late game to not be viable, and they weren't worse enough early game to be bullied out by things like Lucian. Sivir received a visual update and a rework in the last part of Season 3, and she very quickly became the best ADC. Her Q damage was nuts, and she was a massive lane bully and of course had great wave clear and scaling. She was the best ADC in the game hands down, and is one of the best of all time, even though she was only this way for one patch. She immediately was nerfed on the next patch. 
On patch 4.12, Riot intended to nerf Lucian. He was far too strong as a lane bully at the time, so they nerfed his basic attack range by 50 and his Q range by 50. This was a huge nerf. However, in compensation, they gave him a massive buff to his E. His E was given a zero mana cost at all ranks, and his E was given a shorter cooldown, and his E was given a reset to come up quicker with his passive procs. You built 20% CDR in this champion, and he was the best kiting ADC of all time. He could literally dash 15 times in teamfight. Kite forward, kite back, didn't matter. He was nuts. Look at this footage. Lastly, in our ADC S tier, let's talk about the height of the Zaya and Rakan combo. On the release, Zaya and Rakan were nuts. Like, really nuts. They were easily the best bot lane in the game, and both Zaya and Rakan have received plenty of nerfs since their release. During this time, the Ardent support meta started getting more and more popular, and once players figured out that Rakan could be played as an enchanter as well, and Zaya should be maxing E with the Essence Reaver build, they became unstoppable. These two lovers love to destroy games, and they were prioritized heavily in competitive play. Alright, let's talk A tier ADCs. In this season, when Season 9, Vayne was a nightmare after receiving a few buffs, and with her Rageblade and Blade of the Ruin King build that was so popular, a champion that was supposed to be weak on two items and needed 30 minutes to be useful, was really strong on one and broken and fully online on two items. She removed all of her weaknesses and was pretty strong in lane with Press the Attack. Callista following her release has been a massive problem and an issue that Riot has never been able to solve for her. Her passive used to jump her as far backwards as it does forwards, and it even had a bigger range. This champion was permabanned in competitive play. It never got through, and until she was nerfed six times, she finally became bad, and now this dumpster fire of a balanced nightmare, her entire lifespan has never been able to be what she used to be. This probably should never have been a champion that was put into the game. Lastly, for ADCs, let's talk about Caitlyn with Hurricane. Do you remember this? There was an interaction with Caitlyn that reduced headshots cooldown while building Renan's Hurricane, and Caitlyn was already the best ADC in laning phase. Couple these two things together, Caitlyn was the best ADC at laning phase, mid game, late game, didn't matter, she had no weaknesses at all. She was hyper abusive and couldn't be beat by any other ADCs until the interaction was removed. So I've been doing tier list videos and rundowns for a very long time, and the idea of me going from top to bottom and finishing off with support is just because I like that flow. It's pretty easy to follow along by roll and you just go top to bottom. And while I do this, I usually start the line with supports, something like, well, last but not least, supports. Something along those lines. But here's the thing, in this case, with this all-time tier list, support definitely is last but least, genuinely speaking. The problem is that in comparison to other roles, support has only really been good for the last several seasons. There really wasn't a beta Jax or beta Twisted Fate of support. Because back then, if there was a good supportive champion such as Morgana, you just played her in a solo lane. Supports barely used to be able to buy any items, and with the introduction of Sightstone finally into the game, it's the best thing that's ever happened to supports, because they were finally able to buy real items and do real things with their gold. They used to spend every ounce of money that they would get on wards. That being said, S tier has to start with Arden Sensor then, because this is by far the time that the supports were the most powerful. Janna and Lulu with this item were the best supports in the game, and they were incredibly valuable to any team. This one's pretty recent, and you guys know that this item was bonkers, so let's move on. Zyra was a dominant support at Season 6 Worlds, and she was impossible to lane against. It took a very long time for people to figure out what to do against it, and it took a weird support misfortune counterpick by the Rocks Tigers to finally expose Zyra for once. In early seasons, one support that was pretty good was Nunu. He had a lot of utility with his blood boil and was utilized a lot by Moscow 5 back in the day. Release Zyra was also pretty insane, and she had to be nerfed very quickly because she was terrifying to play against. Her damage was completely nuts, and she was far overtuned. Before Executioners was put back into the game and Mortal Reminder was added, because Executioners actually used to be in the game but it was taken out for quite a while, Soraka was nuts and unbeatable. She was used a lot by Immortals Adrian, and she was sleeper OP for a long time, had well above a 54% win rate in solo queue, and was nearly permabanned in solo queue. Next up, A tier supports. Well, support Annie is something that it took many players to finally accept was a real thing, but when it finally came onto the scene, they realized how good it was. She had amazing CC and utility of course with her passive, and her insane range made it impossible to lane against. She really benefited though with the addition of Spell Thief's Edge finally came out as a support item, because she got a lot of gold by outranging the ADCs and supports and poking them down. Realistically, it was good for years, but when people caught onto it, it seems super OP. 
Finally, if we're going to discuss supports, then I believe that Thresh deserves the same treatment and love that we gave to Lee Sin earlier on. Thresh is the all-time king of supportive champions, and he's the best champion and best design champion that's ever come out for the role. He's truly never been bad. There's always a place to pick Thresh. He has everything a supportive champion needs, and is truly a champion that people love. He's the most popular support season in and season out for a reason, and you can show a ton of mastery and skill on the champion. Bunny Fufu spawned an entire career because of Thresh, and that's pretty awesome. This video and this all-time tier list was meant to be fun, and look at some champions as they were back in the day. It's very possible I look past some stuff and miss some things in my research, so don't be afraid to let me know what you thought of it and what you think I missed. I really hope you enjoyed this and found it entertaining, because I know I had a ton of fun making it. Thank you guys for watching, and please like and subscribe.